it definitely is beginning to smell a lot like Christmas. I would like to welcome you back, those that had the chance to spend a few days on vacation. I would like to welcome all those that are watching online. And everybody, all of you, sitting in the pew, waiting for God's Word to speak to you. There are things that are very hard to explain in life. Last summer, one of my friends had a very weird accident. He was cutting the grass, and at one point something got stuck under the deck of the lawnmower. So he was trying to fix the problem, and he managed to stick his fingers where the blades are, in an instance, two of his fingers were chopped off. Stupid, isn't it? I mean, how can you do that? And I was in the area at that time. I went to his house, but he had been taken to the hospital. I only could speak with his mom, an elderly lady, and she was very troubled. I could see on her face, and she said, I asked him, hey, son, didn't you realize if you were going to put your fingers there that was going to happen? And he said, yeah, I knew. And yet, I don't know. So then next morning I had to leave that uh, area, and for quite some time I couldn't get in touch with him. He spent weeks in the hospital, he developed an infection. So then when I finally had the chance to reach him, without even asking him, he told me, hey, when I did that, I knew that was going to happen, and yet... I don't know. It is very hard to explain what happens in those moments. There is a philosophical and a psychological term, acrasia or accuracy, which designates a moment of confusion when you make an irrational decision against what you know for sure would be the best way to go. Neuroscience tries to explain what really is happening in those moments. Well, it would be very difficult to deal with that specific moment. I'm using this just as an illustration. We all had those moments of stupid experiences. But some people imagine or envision God as being a sort of a lawnmower or a mulcher. Somebody that watches you, watches you, trying to catch you in that moment of confusion when you stick yourself into something bad, and then he will hit on you, he will shred you, or, in a jargon, send you to hell. Is that God? In the book of Daniel, chapter 5, we have a new protagonist. King Nabucco is now gone, but his influence is still around. Now his grandson, Belshazzar, is on the throne. Belshazzar is the son of... Uh, Nitocris, Nabucco's daughter, and Nebuchadnezzar, one of the army generals of uh, Nabucco. But now Nabucco is out, but his influence still lingers. In a context like this, Daniel 
speaks to King Belshazzar. And this is what he says in Daniel chapter 5, verse 22. Daniel chapter 5, verse 22. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you, you what? You knew all this. I'm going to rephrase it. You knew all this, and yet, you knew all this, and yet, let us pray. Lord, we are here by your grace, and because you are willing to speak to us, we pray that you will open our hearts to the Holy Spirit and lift Jesus Christ up in front of us. In his name we pray, amen. Let's take a quick look at the structure of the book of this chapter 5. It starts with the king's feast, and it ends with the king's death. In between, you have the writing that appears on the wall, then on the other side, the writing is explained. Nitocris, the mother queen, comes and rebukes King Belshazzar. Then Daniel comes and rebukes him on the other side. And up there, Right on the top, you have Belshazzar that meets Balthazar, or Belshazzar. It's pretty much the same name. Those two people, Daniel and Belshazzar, have the same name, the variant of the same name. They have an encounter right there at the top, and that's where we are going to focus. But the story starts in a banqueting hall, a banqueting hall in which a thousand statesmen are feasting. This guy, Belshazzar, is not the king. He is the corregent. He is a joint ruler. His father, Nabonidus, he is the main king, but he's a sickly guy. And now he resides in an oasis in the desert of Arabia. They are treating him there because of his illness. So now the young co-ruler is home, home alone. And he says, hey, why don't we party? And he sets up a stage banquet that looks most, more like debauchery. They have food, they have wine, they even have women, a display of women, although in that culture, women would have a separate party, not in the same location, in the same room. Something is going weird here, because at one point, according to verse 2, an idea crosses the mind of the king. Verse 2 says, while he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command, and the Aramaic language says, spoke on the order of wine. What does that mean? And somebody speaks on the order of wine. He's drunk. He gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father, or his ancestor, his grandfather, in fact, Nebuchadnezzar, what did he do? had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. And that's exactly what happens. Verse 4 says that they indeed, verse 4, they indeed drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron, wood and stone. But in that moment, it says in verse 5, in the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite to the lampstand so that it can be visible on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. 
And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. It seems that only the king saw the part of the hand. It seems that the other were able to see the writing itself. But the hand was only seen by the king. Verse 6. Then the king's countenance, his color, that's the Aramaic there, his color changed. And his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened. That is actually a description of incontinence. If somebody doesn't know what it means, please translate. He really had a problem, right? He was scared. That was terror. That was horror there in the room. And his knees knocked against each other. And the text says that he cried out aloud that they will bring the, the experts immediately. And yes, the experts show up. And the king says, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. What do you think? Can they solve the problem, the experts? No. Verse 9 says, then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled so before he, he was troubled, now he was greatly troubled, and his countenance, his color was changed again, and his lords were astonished. Everybody goes into panic mode. Now, in this moment, somebody enters the story, and that's the mother queen. That's the daughter of Nabucco, the mother of Belshazzar. She seems to come here uninvited. She comes to the banqueting hall, and she brings into the king's attention somebody, somebody that has been long neglected. And this is what uh, she says. There is, look, look at how, how beautifully the story continues here, how nicely the king speaks about that man. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. I wonder how could she see the spirit of the holy God in this man? When the Spirit of the Holy God is there in a man or woman, people will see that. And in the days of your father, she says, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And what? And King Nebuchadnezzar, she says, your father. And she repeats, hey, 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 your father, the king, made him, made this guy chief of all the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Verse 12, inasmuch as an excellent spirit, an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, explaining enigmas, were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. And now comes one of the most cringe moments in uh, the book of Daniel. It's a cringe moment. Just imagine this. This long neglected statesman comes and walks down the aisle to the banqueting hall. Can you see? Can you imagine him? Can you visualize him? What does he look like? Old? Can somebody tell me how old? Let me help. We are in the 66th year of exile. When they were taken into exile, they were teenagers. So what is the minimum age of Daniel? Uh-huh. He's 80 plus. So can you, can you see him walk in? He, he walks in, and this is cringe because, just imagine, this guy has the same name that I have, and he's before me. So he did not take my name, maybe my parents, because of my grandfather's relationship with him, maybe my parents gave me this name because of him. And this guy, in the days of my grandfather Nabucco, used to be a star. I neglected him. I forgot about him. And this guy is a servant 
of the Most High, the same God whose vessels I brought here so that we can drink wine from them. And I practically mocked the God of this guy. Wouldn't you expect this Belshazzar to be a little humbled by this situation? Uh Uh-uh. Just watch and see how he speaks down to him. Verse 13. Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives, one of the slaves, a son of slavery, that's the Aramaic there, from Judah, my, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Wait, 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 wait. This guy is 80 plus. He has a clean, impeccable record in public administration. He was taken into slavery when he was a kid, a teenager. And now at 80 plus, you are calling him a slave. See who Belshazzar is and see who this nobleman is. I have heard of you. Oh, you heard of me. I have heard of you that the spirit of God or the spirits of the gods is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. What else have you heard? Verse 16. I have heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Why the third ruler? Who's the first ruler? Nebuchadnezzar, the king, right? He's the co-ruler, the second ruler, and this guy would be the third ruler, right? Okay, so what is going to happen here? Daniel answers. Please notice that now he leaves out the classical, O king, live forever. He doesn't use those words. This is what he says. Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. Now, before anybody jumps into making theology here and explain that the reason Daniel didn't want to accept those things is because he had a problem with jewelry. Let me explain something here. That's not the reason. Because if you read on, you will see that eventually he will be given those things and he received them. The message is different. The message here is this. I'm 80 plus. I'm an old guy. I don't need those things. And don't think you can buy, you can pay with half of your kingdom for divine wisdom. Just don't, don't care about it, but when you need it, just buy it. Uh-uh. You cannot do that. So then Daniel goes on and explains, O king, the most high God Give Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. 19. And because of the majesty that he gave him, that is, God gave the king, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. 20. But, and this is the first but here. There's another but, okay? Please watch this. But when his heart was lifted up, when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, and, and, and watch out, watch out, because this is very human here. When, when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, He was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And what? Verse 21. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts. And his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Till, till what? Till he knew. Keep that in mind, please. Till he knew 
He knew what? That the Most High God rules in the kingdom of man and appoints over it whomever He chooses. Now the second but. But. But you, His son, Belshazzar, have not... Did, did, you, did you see what King Nabucco did? What did he do? He humbled his heart, right? But you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although, although you knew all this. All this. I would rephrase it. You knew all this, and yet, and follow, follow now. You knew all this, all of this, all of this. You knew all this, and yet, you have not humbled your heart. What else? 23. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And what else? They have brought the vessels of his house before you. Why? Because you asked for them, right? For you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And what? Five. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And what? Six. This is so beautiful. The God who holds your breath. Can you, can you, can you see? Can you capture this picture? The God who holds your breath in His hand. What was writing on the wall? What was writing on the wall? A hand. Can you see the mo motive here? And, and the God that holds your breath in His hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Now let me ask you something. Is this a moment of confusion in Belshazzar's life? Is it a point or rather a process? A process to a point. Can you make a difference? What Daniel says, hey, you knew all this, all this, you knew them. And although you knew them, you did not know that God, the Most High, rules. And you got to this point, you got to this point here, but there's a whole process behind here. And yes, there is one sin after another. There are five, six things listed here, but the problem is not those. The problem is, what is the problem? You knew, you knew this all. Had you not known all those things, would it have been a problem? Yes and no. Because it depends on how you react to it. You fell down. I'm here to lift you up. But you knew. How does God treat the person that does not know? Ignorance, not willful ignorance, simply ignorance. You don't know. Last summer, when we went on sabbatical, I effected a new car insurance policy here in California. So, logically, I canceled our car insurance policies in Florida. Then I sent my mails, my correspondence over here to the, the address of the church, thinking that when we come back from vacation, we'll just jump on our car in Florida, drive through the country, and it took us like a week. And uh, when I get there, I will be able to check my mails. And that's what I did. We got here, immediately I checked my mails. Guess what? Both my registrations and my driver's license had been suspended for two weeks. Why? Because it's the law in Florida that if you have your cars registered there, then you have to carry insurance there in Florida. I didn't know. Let me ask you something. Had the highway patrol pulled me aside, could I have said, uh, sir, I'm sorry, 
I just didn't know. Could I have said that? I could. I could. That's what we say when they pull us over. I didn't know. There's only one problem. There's a saying that ignorance of the law is no excuse. Of course, now thank God he never stopped us. Well, my co-driver had her license active, so Anda didn't have a problem with that. But still the cars, registration. I don't know how big that thing would have been. What I'm trying to, to say is that if you don't know, is one thing. If you know and you act, act as if you don't know, is a different thing, right? There's a difference there. If I told them, hey, I don't know and I don't know, yeah, but if I knew and I told them, I don't know, that's a lie, isn't it? But what if you don't know something? How would God react to it? Doesn't the Bible teach that God winks at ignorance? But then now, and that's Acts chapter 17, verse 30, but now everybody that knows it should repent, should change his ways. Let me illustrate what happens. And this is a story, a fictitious story, okay? Any resemblance to reality, to people or events, is pure coincidence. You were born in a Christian family, a godly family. You know, you know your grandfather was a godly person. You know your grandfather had not always been like that. You know your grandfather had a conversion experience. You know God intervened in his life. And you know there even was a man, because usually that's how it happens, there is a man through whom God intervenes in somebody's life. You know all this. You know it from him, you know it from your mother, you know it from the chronicles of the king, you know it from all different sources. You know, and yet, and yet, one day you throw a party with your friends. And uh, you drink, and you eat, and you drink, and you eat. And at one point, something crosses your mind, an idea, hey, at the church there, I know there are some communion vessels. I know they keep them in a certain cabinet there in the deaconry room. I know those are special vessels, they don't use them for potluck. I know those are sacred, and sacred means that they are set apart for a special destination, a special purpose. I know you cannot just take them and do whatever you want with them. I know that sacred means special, set apart, and there is sacred place. For instance, the church is a sacred place dedicated to God. There are sacred objects. For instance, those communion vessels are sacred objects dedicated to God. There is sacred time. Can you tell me a sacred time? A Sabbath is a sacred time. He said it's sacred. There is sacred money even. Can you tell me sacred money? Yeah, he said it's sacred. So I know all of these. And yet, on the order of wine, this is what I do. I send my friend who happens to know the code at the entrance of the church and tell him, hey, go bring over those communion uh, plates. And... Uh, he goes and brings 
the plates over the trays, and we start eating and drinking from the communion vessels. Are you following me? What am I doing? Is that a point? I made a mistake. I messed up because I'm drunk. Or it's a process, a process that led to this. Because we, when, when something of, of this nature happens, like what happened to Belshazzar, we tend to think, oh, that is cruel. God did this to this guy. Wait, wait, wait. Don't look at the point only. Because Daniel tells him, the problem is you knew all this. You knew all this. See? I have this pillow. I, I, I will, will have to explain now to my children that I'm not preaching about the pillow. I'm using the pillow as an illustration. Because my daughter asked me, oh, are you going to preach about that? No, about, about Jesus using this pillow. So here's what happens. God worked in the life of Daniel and in the life of Nabucodonosor and in the life of Belshazzar. Daniel decided early in his life that he would follow God, he would be with God, so he would always be like this to God. I mean, take uh, the tears off or make them tears of, hap of happiness, okay? Happy with God. Walk with God steadily. Nabucco is different. When Nabucco enters the scene of history, what we know about him is he has his back to God. And then in chapter 1, God shows him some wonderful, godly young people. And this is what happens to Nabucco. He opens up a little bit to God, but then he falls back. Then you go a few steps in history, and again, chapter 2 happens when he has a dream. He's still his, with his back to God, but now the dream that he sees and, and the explanation turns him around. The problem is, soon after, he decides to go back. Following me? So at one point, God intervenes again through the three Hebrew in the fiery furnace. Again, the king is turned around. He looks up to God. He even gives a thanksgiving sermonette. But then what? That's, that's about human will human decision. He goes back in that mode. Until in chapter 4, he sees the big tree, and he finally decides for good to be with God. Is that beautiful? Absolutely. Now, what does God do with Belshazzar? Well, Belshazzar is grown in the family of Nabucco. He probably heard about God, the Most High, from Nabucco himself. So he had a chance to turn and smile back to God. What did he do? Turn back. Then his mom told him the story about his grandpa. Could he turn around? Of course. What does he do? He turns back. Then he reads about that story in the Chronicles, because remember, Nabucco had sent out a letter of his testimony to the, the entire kingdom. So in the Chronicles, you will find it, right? Because you are the grandson of the king. You have a chance to turn around. Do you turn? No. And then again, at one point, somebody, when you are walking with a friend, an older friend, he looks out and he says, hey, see, that guy there, that's Daniel. You know, Daniel from the story with Nabucco, your grandpa. Oh, okay, all right. He has a chance to turn. Does he turn? No. And here we are. And Daniel tells him, what does he tell him? You knew this all. 
And yet, and yet, and yet. Do, do, you, do you see how God's grace fights for somebody? How God's grace tries to turn human beings to Him? But God cannot crash a human being's will. He has to respect the freedom of choice that He gave us, endowed us by creation. So then Daniel goes on, verse 24. Then the fingers at the hand were sen- of the hand were sent from Him. Yeah, from Him. The one that keeps your breath in His hand. He sent the hand. And this writing was written. What was the writing? Mene, mene, tekel, ufarsin. What is that? God has numbered your kingdom. And that appears twice. As if it's once for Nebuchadnezzar and once for Belshazzar. Tackle. You have been weighed in the balances. In the balances. I mean, you have been weighed not once, not twice. You have been weighed again and again and again. And you were found what? One thing. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given. Please notice, it's not overcome and taken. It's given to the Medes and Persians. And this final observation here, and the next, the final two verses of the chapter, explains what happened. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was what? Slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom he didn't take it. Was the word there? He received. It was given to him. Ah, that's what Belshazzar didn't know. He didn't know God was into this. God was there. God's hand that wrote on the wall, the, the hands that keep his breath, they are involved there. You may ask, okay, so where is now the Christmas message? It's here. It's here. It's here. Do you realize that when these folks were partying in the banqueting hall, the army of Cyrus, the army of the Medes and Persians were already around the walls of the city? So they are under siege, and yet... And he knows, he knows, and yet, I don't know. Because he knows one thing. He knows one way to overcome the city, to make Babylon fall. They would have to batter the walls with rams, but the walls were so thick, there was no way for them to get in. The other possibility was to get them out. So the enemy either gets in or gets them out. Through what? Starvation. But Xenophon, a Greek historian, says that the spies of Cyrus got news from the city that they had food for 20 years in the city. So Belshazzar said, hey, I know this, I know that, let's party. If they have uh, supplies, they have resources for 20 years, all right. Be our guests. What he didn't know is that God hands, God's hand was in that thing. It was a God thing, not only human thing. And what happened? Well, some years prior, the queen, the mother queen, Nitocris, had some building projects in the city. She wanted to build a bridge to unite the two parts of the city that was dissected by the river Euphrates. To build a bridge, she had to handle the water, so she diverted the water in some canals before the water entered the city. Now Cyrus discovers there used to be some canals there, canals there, channels, and what does he do? 
he decides to dug them up, to dig them up, to excavate those channels, diverted the water, and under the protection of the night, under the city wall, his armies, and that's confirmed by Herodotus, the historian, they walked into the heart of the city. Prophecy was fulfilled. Prophecy from Daniel 2, Babylon fell. Prophecy from Daniel 5, Belshazzar was killed in that very night. So where is the Christmas message? Here comes the Christmas message. Did you know that Cyrus, Cyrus is not mentioned here. Darius is mentioned here. Darius is either a mead name for Cyrus or a general or family member of Cyrus that became a co-ruler with Cyrus. But the armies of the Medes and Persians were, were led by Cyrus. He was the king. Did you know that Cyrus is a type for Jesus Christ the Messiah? Yes, 100 years before he appeared on the scene of history, there was prophecy in the book of Isaiah about him coming, my anointed. That's how God, God calls him, anointed or Mashiach, the Messiah. Yes, Cyrus is a prototype of the Messiah. Cyrus comes from the east. The river Euphrates is dried up. Babylon falls. And guess what? The captives are allowed now to go back to their homeland, to Jerusalem. Are you catching it? So what's the Christmas message? Well, this is the Christmas message. The, the, the message of the Advent is a double message. It's not only a message that goes back to the cradle to Bethlehem. The message of the Advent also goes forward because now the baby can be born again and again and again and again in our hearts. But the baby has grown up. The baby is now there in the heavenly sanctuary and is about to come back. And yes, just the way Cyrus came from the east, Jesus Christ comes from the east according to the Bible. And just the way the river Euphrates was dried the river Euphrates, according to Revelation chapter 16, will be dried up. And just the way ancient Babylon fell, the Babylon of this world will fall when the king from the east will march in. And here is the Advent message. Those that were under the rule, the rulership of Babylon, will finally have a chance to go home, not to the earthly Jerusalem, but to the heavenly Jerusalem. Isn't that a beautiful Christmas message? Amen. Now, this is the question. Unfortunately, the Babylon of, of this world does not accept the knowledge of God the Most High. Please look out, watch around, and see how things are happening in history now, how things are happening all over the place, things that are telling you and everybody in Babylon that the most high rules. Are you noticing that? Can you see how, how things are, are, are running out or are just falling through the cracks? We cannot control them. Isn't that a message from the Messiah that He rules? Can't you see that in spite of all those proofs, all, the, all that evidence, we have a situation in which Babylon says, yeah, I know, but I don't know. So in this context, the question is, you know, right at the peak, we had that encounter between two men. One was Belshazzar, and the other one, Belteshazzar. Who are you? 
Belshazzar is the guy that knows and knows not. Daniel is the guy that knows and what he knows, he does. And that's exactly what it means to be waiting for the advent. Yes, Jesus Christ was born 2,000 years ago. Yes, he can be born again in our hearts so we can be born again if by any chance we are dead. But he is coming back. And that's the real advent at this time. The question is, do you know? Do you know? And if you know, then what? Or you know it, and yet, I would like to encourage you to make that decision in your heart. Yes, God is gracious. But the human being is fragile. There is a possibility for somebody to get to the point of no return, not because God gives up on a human, but because something breaks in the human. And no matter how God tries to touch, touch again, softly, tenderly, or strongly, no, nothing. It's time to turn around as long as that fine mechanism is still able to give the command and turn around. Is there anybody here that would like to give his or her life over to Jesus Christ the Savior in a special way, being touched by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that was in Daniel, the excellent Spirit? If you are one of those, I would like to ask you to raise your hand and express your desire to give your heart completely to Him. Yes. And no, amen, no, 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 and the Most High rules. Amen.